Uh, let me just segue again, because the other thing that you talked about in one of your podcasts, and I was really very pleasantly surprised to hear you to a certain extent, and you never hold back just like I don't, um, is you railed against supplementation. And I was very, very impressed with that because that's something that I have a personal bias against. I believe that my diet should supple supplement what I need. Obviously, if there's a health issue where it's missing, you want to supplement till it's supplemented. But our diet should provide everything. And uh, a couple of questions. If you, if you can firstly reiterate that position, but secondly, also, uh, now that Nisha's pregnant or even, well, you didn't know before, but if, she, if you were planning a pregnancy, what supplementation would you have used? What, what would you have recommended for her? So I, I'm not a big proponent of supplements. I do not own a supplement company. And unlike many of uh, the, the movers and shakers in our space, as you know, uh, you know, they, they talk about this diet and, and the power of this diet. Oh, but you also need my supplements, right? And I find that a bit disingenuous. And it's, it's almost, it's, it's a lot uh, the same as the difference between allopathic medicine and naturopathic medicine. An allopath is like, oh, you know, this, that, and the other, and here's a prescription for two or three or four or five pills. Uh, you go see the naturopath and they're like, yeah, you don't need any of those prescriptions. That's all dumb. You need to eat this diet and do this and this and this. Oh, and here's a handful of supplements that I happen to sell. Uh, and, you know, it's like it, it's <laughs> it's two flavors of the same, you know, ice cream. It's just it's just the, the flip side of the coin. And so I, I want I, you looking at this through a, a biological and an evolutionary lens there can be no need for supplements in the human diet. It, it is impossible for there to be a need if, number one, we're eating the, the proper human diet, the proper foods, and number two, if the food that we are eating was grown or raised properly, and the soil that that food was grown in or grazed upon is being treated properly. All those things have to be in place. And so any supplementation that I do talk about is either because of someone's geographic location on the planet, that can, that can make supplementation necessary, or that they are living in a, a, a food forest, if you'll permit me to use that term, uh, a, a, a desert where even though there are lots of things to eat, they're all nutrient void. Right. And so if you're if you're living in that kind of food environment, then you may need supplementation. And I tell people all the time, if you're eating a standard American diet, you probably should be taking a handful of supplements every day, every single day for every day of your life. But the, the closer you move towards eating a proper human diet that's full of meat and eggs and seafood and, and some veg and some berries and some nuts, if you want those that you 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 obviate the need for virtually every supplement. And so if you're eating meat and eggs, that that marks off a long list of supplements that people will try to sell you and tell you that you need for your skin or your hair or or your joints or your muscles or your whatever. You don't need any of that. You're getting it all in the most bioavailable, bioabsorbable, biousable form by eating real food that contains that vitamin or that mineral. Now, if you live on, on the interior of a huge continent and you don't have access to seafood, then you quite possibly could be iodine deficient. And in fact, back at, during World War I, that's why we started to put iodine in salt is because we couldn't draft enough young men to go fight and die for their country because they all had a big fat gorder, right? Uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, up in that area is known as the gorder belt. Because if you don't supplement with iodine and you don't have access to seafood, you're going to have a gorder and you're going to have hypothyroidism and, and the children are going to have cretinism. It's, it's not going to be good. And so we started putting iodine in the salt as a way for everybody to get a little bit of iodine. Now, the amount of iodine in iodized salt is just barely enough to keep you from having a gorder. It's not nearly enough to, to, to replenish your iodine deficiency. Your, your depletion. It's not enough to give you optimal health, but it is enough to keep you from having a gorder, and therefore you're not a 4F, and therefore you get drafted, and therefore we get to send you off to war. Right. Okay? 
So, but now living in a modern society with container ships and, and overnight delivery, we all have access to seafood. And, and we, all, we also all have access to the internet. And with a little bit of research, you, you'll find that there are a couple of very inexpensive supplements that you can get iodine from that's very absorbable and usable. And that's one of the supplements that I would recommend to Nisha if we were talking, having the conversation, what should I supplement just to make sure I've got plenty. Uh, and, and one of them is iodine because uh, she's already eating the meat and eggs. She's eating some nuts and some veg and some cheese. She's getting a huge long list of vitamins and minerals and, and amino acids and fatty acids that she needs already. But she may not be getting enough iodine. And there's quite a bit of research in, out of Europe from decades ago that show that a, a child's IQ can suffer from three to 10 IQ points, three to 10 full points, if the mother is depleted of iodine when she conceives and as she carries the, the pregnancy. And then as she breastfeeds, she's not gonna have any iodine in her breast milk unless she herself has a good source of iodine. And so that, that's hugely important for any woman who, who thinks she might conceive. So I, notice I didn't say plan to conceive. Right, I, right. If it's possible that you might conceive, you need to be thinking about iodine. I think and not then, just for the, for the pregnancy, for yourself as well, because the, the baby will to a certain extent tap into your resources. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right in, in terms of the iodine. The only other thing that I put Janae on when she had Rian, our son, uh, was a high folate multivitamin. Um, yep. And was it necessary? Possibly not, but I wasn't going to take that risk. There was right. no downside it's, to it. But it, it's such than... an egregious uh, uh, birth defect that that right. it, out of a preponderance of caution, I don't blame you one bit. I, I did. We didn't have the the folate discussion because she's such a carnivore that there's no way she's not getting enough folate in all the B vitamins. But I I, I totally understand your point that that you know because if you've seen a, a child with Spina bifida. You don't ever, ever want that for a child. Uh, and the other supplement is vitamin D. If you live at a very northern latitude or a very southern latitude, people forget about the southern latitude, right? And but south, if, south you, north, yeah. if, if you live far enough south or far enough north, you probably need a vitamin D supplement, or you need to really go out of your way to eat vitamin D rich foods. Uh, and I've got, I've got YouTube videos on iodine rich foods and vitamin D rich foods just for that very reason, because they're so important. Again, uh, there's research out of Europe and Scandinavia about vitamin D deficiency in the mother and the effect that that has on the newborn and on the child as they develop through all the stages of life. It, and so uh, being slightly deficient in iodine or slightly deficient in vitamin D doesn't cause an egregious birth defect like spina bifida, right? But what it does is it, it loads the dice against the child. And so they're gonna, they're gonna be have a, a little bit lower IQ. They're gonna be a little less, uh, they're gonna thrive a little less. And they're gonna, you know what I'm saying? It's they're almost like- you have potential. So if, that's right. if you've got a certain genetic potential, you may be completely functioning really well, be a very smart kid, but you might be here. Instead exactly. Of, you're absolutely correct. And I think right. that's a large part of the dietary side uh, that, that is so important. But I love the fact that you and I are both really minimalists when it comes to supplementation recommendation. And we really focus very heavily on the food. And, and you know, uh, something that I talk a lot about, and you've mentioned this a few times already, is that no matter what the egg is that you buy, unless you interfere with it by eating it, it could have become a chicken. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it really, a an egg has everything in the right proportion in terms of micro and macronutrients to become a chicken. So if you say, oh, I don't eat liver, well, you're eating a chicken's liver every time you eat an egg. It's just deconstructed. So, you know, we look to our diet, especially more leaning toward the carnivore side, we look to that side of the diet to provide a lot of those micronutrients that have been part or would have been part of that animal's life in the first place. So, uh, you know, those are all very, very important things. And again, I, I wish you well through this. Just one other comment, just to, to flesh out the, the pediatric or the neonatal side. I had this discussion with a woman by the name of Hasina uh, Kaji, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. She's a physician in South Africa. Um, and we talked uh, extensively about the early childhood period, the zero to maybe four or five years of age. And, you know, Ken, what I looked at the other day, I 
happen to typically shop in the outside of, a of the store, in the outside lanes. And I was looking for one particular thing, actually for my dog, and I had to go to the interior lanes. And I'm a pediatric surgeon. I, I, I deal with kids a lot. But I was just astounded at these two rows of just wall-to-ceiling crap for kids, toddler formulas, toddler drinks, and the marketing and the rubbish that, they, that was stated in the labeling was just so wrong. And there's this massive multi-trillion dollar industry that focuses on providing food for the zero to four-year-olds as if they're not human beings. Because uh, we raised Rian, and I think you've done the same with Beckett and you're gonna do the same. Rian has always exclusively eaten what we eat. His first mm -hmm. mouthful was a piece of ribeye steak that he sucked on because he didn't have teeth at four months. And he's, we've never, ever, ever bought ch child-specific food mm -hmm. or baby-specific food other than the formula because Janae couldn't breastfeed. But other than that, we've never, ever fed them food. And uh, has that been your experience as well? I mean, it's why should we feed a child all this crap that industry tells us is healthier for us than what God and nature has provided for us. It doesn't. No, I think I think you're you're exactly right. And I would I would anybody listening to this, if anything that we're saying is is foreign to you, or you're like I have never heard a doctor talk like this. This is outrageous. You have to understand. In order to understand a human being, you have to think about every single question through a physiological lens, through a biological lens, and through an evolutionary lens. You have to consider the question at hand. So if your question is, should I buy those cute little Gerber little snack bites that are made of wheat? It's whole wheat, right? And it's, you know, it's got canola oil, so it's no saturated fat whatsoever. And there's only a tiny bit of sugar at it. And they and added extra vitamin D and vitamin C. They added some vitamins, yes. The, and, and I understand those vitamins were made in a chemical factory. They're, they're not naturally occurring vitamins, but still, they've got to have some benefit. So if your question becomes, will my child suffer in some way, physically or emotionally, if I don't buy a single product from Gerber or Kraft or Heinz or Kellogg's or, 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 or Post or Craig Quaker, Will my child suffer in any physical or mental way? And the answer has to be, it has to be no. That's not my opinion. That's not Dr. Sivas's opinion. That's just a biological fact. We've only had access to such foods for the last less than 100 years. And Ken, there's still a lot of people in this world that don't have access to those foods. That's right. So that's I, exactly you're right. Absolutely right. And I think, I think that is just such an important message because... Uh, you know, I don't have TV at home, but the other day I was watching a football game at a friend's house and every 10 minutes an ad came on for pizza. And I haven't eaten pizza in many years, but at the end of the thing is, that, where's the number for pizza we've got to order? And obviously we didn't order it, but the bombardment, that subliminal bombardment of you must, yep. nobody advertises steak and broccoli on TV. No, uh, and I think, I think television ads are very telling, doctor. Let me, uh, let me tell you my, I have a little, um, uh, a little thing I do. I, we never watch television at home. Never watch network television ever. Right? We just don't. But I have this uh, little thing I do every time I go to speak at a conference and I'm staying in a hotel. I will watch one of the news channels and I alternate between CNN and Fox News because I'm completely ambivalent when it comes to politics. And so whichever one I watched last time, I watch the other one this time. And every commercial break, there is a junk food ad. And then there's a pharmaceutical pill or injection ad. Then there's a junk food ad. Then there's a pharmaceutical ad. And then back to our normally scheduled program. And then 13 minutes later, that same thing repeats. And I think it's very telling what they're, what they're advertising. Uh, you don't have to advertise steak and broccoli because we know intuitively those things are very healthy and they're, they're part of a proper human diet. You don't have to trick or delude or propagandize people into buying those things. We just know that those are good for us. And even, even people who believe in a plant-based diet, they're still going to know intuitively that blueberries are better than blueberry granola bars. They're just, we know these things. But when we've seen that commercial so many times that we can unconsciously hum the jingle and know every single word to the jingle, 
that has an effect on our decisions when we're in the grocery store. And of course, you intimated you shop on the outer aisles of a grocery store, but everything that's advertised is right in the middle of the store because the, the, the psychologists know that we tend to gravitate towards the middle of the store. And so they put the things that have the highest profit markup in the middle of the store. That's where the company that made it makes the highest profit, and that's where the store makes the highest profit. Well, look, you know, Ken, as you said that, the food that I buy is wrapped in plastic clear plastic or has no wrappers. The stuff you buy in the center of the aisle all have these sexy wrappers with beautiful colors and big words where they market to you. You don't have to market a piece of steak to me. All I want That's to know right. is what the price is. Right. But all that crap on the interior aisles, the marketing is just, whether it's ads on TV or the marketing on those inner aisles, you can't not buy it. That's right. And anytime any anybody listen to this, if you think and you're about to make a food choice decision, and, and that there has ever been an advertisement on television, in a magazine, or on the internet for what you're about to buy, I can tell you that without exception, that is not real human food and you should not buy it, period, the end.